Hello, 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 hello. Welcome to the Animation Industry Podcast. My name is Terry and I have a pet dog named Moose. And Hazal, if you're listening, Moose says hi. This episode is with Rachel Gitlovich, who is going to share everything you ever wanted to know about unionizing animation because she helped head up unionizing Titmouse New York just this past month, January 2022. Now, besides all this fancy union talk we're gonna get into, Rachel is a 2D character animator living in New York City, and she's got over 10 years experience working on projects with Netflix, Disney, Cartoon Network, YouTube, and of course, Titmouse. Now, besides all this fancy animation talk, fun fact, Rachel used to be a blacksmith. Now, without further ado, let's jump into the chat. Welcome, Rachel, how are you doing? I'm doing great, how are you? I'm doing great, I'm excited. I haven't chatted about uh, unions or anything on this podcast yet, which is really interesting and exciting. But first, before we get into that, I just want to know a little bit more about you. Like, uh, thinking back to, you know, young Rachel, why did she choose this industry path as her best career? <laughs> um, yeah, uh, well, like every other artist you've possibly spoken to, I, you know, <laughs> held on to my prenatal crayon in the womb and, uh, no, I'm just kidding. Um, I, so I, I'm Russian, so I come from a slightly unique background in that Russians culturally value animation like it's not hmm. seen as like the you know it doesn't kind of have the same like sheen that cartoons or cartoonishness has in the united states so i grew up on soviet animation um along with a healthy dose of like looney tunes and disney and um and then later in my more formative years you know that's when we get into like the big epics like studio ghibli and lord of the rings and things like that um so i knew that i wanted to go into the arts and I chose animation because it was such a varied art form. Um, like if I wanted to sculpt, I can go into stop motion. If I wanted to be a DP, like I could still do that as a storyboard artist, right? Like you can wear so many hats and experiment with so many different things. Um, it just really that the I, I think I was mostly attracted to the medium. Interesting. The wait, wait. So so like growing up in Canada and the US. When a kid is like, I want to become an animator, their parent is like, no, 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 no. You're becoming like an engineer or a doctor. But in Russia, you're like, I want to become an animator. And your parents are like, yes. <laughs> uh, yeah, kind of. I mean, that's that's also like why you go to the United States, right? It's because you have the ability to choose your profession, yeah, which is fair. not something they had in the Soviet Union. They were like, we're transferring you to this department in this part of the country. Have a nice life. Oh, no. <laughs> Okay, so uh, you were like, I want to become an animator. And then w at what point did you decide to take it seriously? Like you went to school and you're like, this is this is the path I'm pursuing because there's no better path for me. <laughs> um, I, I, I think it was because of my math teacher. I was, uh, I was in like an honors math class or like AP or something like that. And they have you take a test. And he kind of looked at me and was like, why are you doing this? You're going to art school. Like he just assumed I was going to art school. Like I haven't decided what colleges I was applying to. Like, stop like, doing my math. <laughs> <laughs> just like, what are you doing? Um, and I'm like, yeah, you know, I guess. I mean, I was ready. I already had a relationship with my alma mater, University of the Arts, which ironically enough, speaking of unions, um, the faculty there is also recently unionized and in negotiations. Uh, for their first collective bargaining agreement. So I'm getting it from, from all sides. Um, so, you know, I already had a relationship with them. Um, and uh, cause I was taking like pre-college classes and things like that. So it was sort of, it was kind of like easy for me. Cause like I had a relationship with the school and I applied and they accepted and they gave me a good scholarship. And I'm like, I could stay home. I have this nice scholarship. Um, so, you know, education is expensive so let's just do it this way amazing so like I'm just so like on the topic of unions I'm just wondering like you know you're a freshly graduated college student uh who wants to pursue animation like what like I am just trying to like configure this into a question but like how did you end up getting into the industry and like uh versus if with a unionized climate, how would that have changed that change now, I guess? Because you because you also got into the industry like <coughs> 10 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. So obviously, same rules do not apply. Also, it is going to vary. It, it varies 
a lot by where you are too. Like I can't necessarily speak to the Canadian industry yeah. or how it is in Los Angeles, but I can speak uh, to the, the New York industry. So when, you know, I graduated right after the huge recession in 2008, I graduated in 2010 and, you know, jobs were lean, like you took whatever you can get. So they really encouraged internships. And I was very lucky to have an internship in 2009 at a small boutique studio called Flickr Lab. Um, and, you know, I made a lot of friends there. Like all, like big thing is like making friends. Um, <laughs> me and a coworker, we always joke, it's not about networking. It's about friend working in a way. Um, <laughs> because that. like, there's nothing, there's nothing scarier than being like, if you're like at a, let's say like you're a student or rather not a student, let's say that you're like a working professional or a filmmaker and you're going to a festival because when you, you want to just get drunk, hang out with your friends and watch a bunch of cool films. And then like the really nervous, desperate, sweaty students come up to you and like, you could just like smell the, how do I get a job off of yeah, them? And, like, oh no. Can't help them. You're not HR. You're not a director. You're not a producer. Like you have no hiring and firing abilities. You have no advice. You're like, I don't know, kid, but like, good luck, you know? <laughs> so it's, uh, there's like a big difference between approaching somebody because you want to network yeah. versus approaching somebody because you're just there to make friends. I think that's, I think that's a big one. Like making friends while you're at an internship is great because the scary, Oh, how do I break in is gone. Like you broke in as an intern. And now, you know, not only do you have to demonstrate that you're, you know, you can like do your responsibilities as an intern, but really the goal of an internship is just to make as many friends as humanly possible. Interesting. Um, I love that you call it friends instead of networking. So like, okay, so say I'm going to a conference and I'm the sweaty uh, individual who's like wants to get a job and, and like the conferences here in Toronto, there's always like portfolio reviews and there's like a lineup like out the door and like everybody is just like trying yep. desperately to get an in somehow. And if I, how do I approach it and be like, I'm here to make friends and just like chat people up and laugh at stuff and hope and, and like hope something comes of it? Like, it, you know? Yeah, it's, there's no, like, there's, there's no formula. Like, this isn't something that you can force. Um, so what worked out for me is... Sorry, this is looking back, it's very ridiculous. Um, so I I came up to the International Ottawa Animation Festival uh, and I went to the, the conference portion of it um, with a puppet because I was pitching, I was pitching a live action puppet show, but it was about an animation studio. Um, and the whole thing was just very ridiculous. So I signed up for a lot of pitch sessions and whatever. Yeah. And I kept bumping into this one individual, like over, you know, like, he helped me figure out where the registration was. Like I'd see him in the lounges all the time. And like, I was memor I was made memorable by the fact that I had a puppet. Like I didn't yeah. bring a puppet to stand out. Like that's obnoxious, but like I was there with my puppet. <laughs> like only talking waiting. to people in your puppet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like I was there with the puppet because I was waiting for my pitch and I brought a puppet right. to the pitch right. because right. that's what I was instructed to do by my mentor. Um, so yeah, like I had bumped into this individual enough times that like we just formed a friendship. And then later on, like much later on, I came to learn that he's like the CEO of Cell Action, which is like a like a animation uh, software, which is really cool. Um, mini plug. It's it's, it's cool <laughs> played around with it a little bit. It's very interesting. But um, right, yeah. But it's just like you know, and like we became close friends. Like we always like seek each other out to grab like dinner, like Aww. at CCN or Annecy or like. Do you Ottawa still bring your Europe. puppet? No, he's retired. <laughs> He's yeah, he's retired. Um, but, uh, you know, so like that can happen, you know, it's sort of like, it's like when you're, when you're single and all of your friends, you know, have significant others and you're like, how did you find someone? And they're like, I don't know, man, it just <laughs> happened. You know, it's, it's the same way. Like you can't force it, but like, the thing is like, be patient with yourself, be kind to yourself. It will happen. Yeah. Like um, don't get super discouraged. If you go to a conference, try to friend, friend, up everybody and leave like <laughs> yeah you know what I mean um things that you can do is you can you know like also like act like a professional don't think of yourself as a student think of yourself as this person's peer mm -hmm. you know 
um, and be respectful, you know, don't just talk about yourself and what you want from them, yeah. right? Ask them questions like, oh, hello, I'm new in town. Um, is this your first time here? Oh yeah, this is my first time at this festival. You, This is your 10th time here, whoa. Like what's a great place to go? Oh, that pub, awesome, thanks. Maybe I'll see you later, you know? So just like. Totally, totally, yeah, makes makes sense. Like if you, if you form the connection and you hit it off, great, then keep going. But if not, it's all right. Um, yeah. Okay, so uh, how, okay, so I just, maybe we should like do a little, a little wrap on like your career before we get into all my <laughs> thousand union questions. Um, but yeah. like you've been a 2D animator forever. And, uh, you know, how do you, what is the thing that's made you successful over the years and like made you like people bring you back and like be like, we need Rachel on our team. Like what is, what is that driving you underlying success skill level wise, et cetera? Yeah. Um, so I'm going to turn to some great advice, um, from Neil Gaiman <laughs> Ooh, <okay. laughs> on, you know, how to, how to write, like getting hired is one thing. That's just the planets have to align for that to happen. You just have to be in the right place at the right time, know the right people and yeah. do a good test, right? It's, it's just about, it's just as much about who you know as it is what you know, right? But um, now how do you stay employed? And the, the thing there is you have to fulfill two of the three requirements. You have to be fast. You have to, people have to like you a lot. Um, and you have to like you have to be able to like meet your deadlines or you have to be extremely highly skilled or like really, really personable. Um, so, you know, if you're really, really personable, right, like you bring donuts in the morning and like you're generally friendly and like people just like to be around you and you're an exceptionally good artist, then, you know, the fact that you're slower on the deadlines is going to be more forgivable okay. if you are if you're like super antisocial, you hate people, but you get like, you hit your deadlines and you're a phenomenal artist, people will be happy with you. They'll be like, yes, thank you. Like you're the one actually making us money, not the person bringing donuts every morning, but you know, yeah. um, it's fine. So it's like, you know what I mean? It's like finding that balance. Also like humility. Um, something that frustrates me with young artists is like they're so scared to come off like they don't know what they're doing that they don't ask you any questions so yeah. they make mistakes but then like it just gets awkward you know what I mean like you can you can tell when like somebody is in um in a dailies meeting with the director and they're just not delivering on their scene and it's sort of like why don't you show it to somebody else like why don't you like you know what I mean? Like it's a, like animation's a team sport. Totally, totally. Um, Why didn't you bring so this up I, before? Like now it's causing us more work that you haven't done this. Yeah, and the deadline. You know, yeah, like nobody expects you to know everything. Like we're all artists here. Like we're all still in the process of learning. Like I don't see myself as like the best animator ever. Like I like I'm so, you know, I I'm very very competent by sheer experience, but also. Like when I started out at Titmouse, I don't know how I got the job, honestly. I think it was because a friend like really pulled for me um, and I was not a very strong artist. Like I did, like I was a strong artist, but I feel like I wasn't strong enough for the specific requirements of television 2D animation, yeah. um, which is which is really, really hard. Like you have to hit the ground running. Um, but I would just, I, I talked to everybody. I learned as much as I could. Like I was a little sponge, like, honestly, like two of my best friends in the whole world, uh, you know, they were the first two people to like really help me out at Titmouse. Like I'd run to them all the time. Like, Hey, I can't figure out the scene. Like, do you have any opinions? Like, can you look at this? Um, at one point I sat next to uh, somebody who worked in the cleanup department at Disney. Like he worked on like Pocahontas and Mulan and like all this really cool stuff. So like any chance I could get to pick his brain about stuff, I would. Um, and I was like really confused. I'm like, we're working with somebody from Disney. Like, why isn't he walking around with a small mob? You know, like if this was right, like if this was an animation conference, there would be a small mob. But for some reason, now that we're in a work environment, people like stay, stay like it was very strange. But I think, I think just, you know, humility is always really helpful and just like asking questions and like like sometimes you know I just like go over to a senior artist and be like hey do you mind if I like hang out for a bit they're like yeah sure and like you know they're animating and I'll see them like use a hotkey I've never seen before I'm like whoa whoa whoa, whoa yeah. what's that and they would like quickly explain it to you and you're like oh I've been I've been clicking through like three menus this entire time like you've just saved me like 
an hour a week, you know? Totally. So, so for you, it's like, it sounds like you have like a very curious, uh, nature to always, you know, be learning and like leveling up your skills. Um, and then just aware of the, the trifecta of, uh, 2d TV success, which is, um, deadlines, personability and skill. Cool. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Thanks for sharing that. I've never heard somebody like so distinctly put that together. Okay, let's talk about unions. Um, I don't know where to start. Where do you want to start? Because like, you know, just this month, as we're like in the last dregs of the month right now, just this month, you got unionized in New York, which is amazing. Like it's uh, phenomenal. So I guess now Tim House is like unionized everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, so wh where do you want to start? Like maybe, maybe tell me a, bit, a little bit about history of uh, you know, unionizing New York or Titmouse or whatever. Yeah, sure. We can go in a little bit of a, a history. So um, I, I don't know my history quite as well as like somebody like Tom Cito, who literally wrote the book on the subject would. Um, but if you're interested in the history of animation unions, definitely uh, check out um, his book. It's by Tom Cito. I think it's called uh, Draw the Line or Drawing the Line. Um, apologies for um, muddling up the title. Um, so uh, animation unions actually started in New York. So there was animation unions in New York before they happened out in LA. Okay. If I remember correctly, um, I think it was Fleischer Studios that unionized. Um, I don't know my history well enough to speak eloquently on it, but there is like the history of, of unions in New York is very like, in animation specifically is like a very like stop and start. Like there was the Cartoonist Guild um, in the seventies and late eighties, but that kind of like folded and like became part of a different guild. But it's interesting that um, New York historically hasn't been able to really hold on to its own union for very for very long um, because which is like, I mean, it's ironic because New York is such a union town. There are so many unions in New York, but not animation, despite, you know, Los Angeles being so heavily unionized. I think I think what makes this moment so historic is it's like the first New York animation union in a very long time, like a meaningful one, but also it's it's because we're partnering up. It's because we're now part of the animation guild out in LA because before yeah. the charter was structured in such a way that they did not have jurisdiction outside of LA County, but now they do. And now it's a national local, which means that now the animation guild has the, has the jurisdiction across the entire United States, which oh, wow. is like significantly overdue. Yeah. So um, does, does this mean like other unions have been are, are brewing in other areas of the states as well? Like I have no idea. You know, I have no idea. I, I mean, it yeah, happened it, in New York. <laughs> it happened in New York. Yeah. And like for the longest time, they said that, oh, it'll never happen here in New York. Like mm -hmm. it'll never happen. Right. Like that's what I've always heard. Like, oh, we've tried and we failed. Like New yeah. York is just not unionizable. So, so like at Timos in New York, I had read like something like over 90% of people like signed the union. Um, so people were itching to get in on this, I guess. Yeah, yeah, they, I, they were. Um, I think that the internal culture shifted very dramatically over the course of the past five years, I'd say. Like mm -hmm. five years ago, even I was like, like five years ago, like I wasn't pro-union at all. Mm -hmm. So what were, so five years ago, you were like, I don't want a union because. I, because I didn't know, right. Because like, I didn't actually know what a union was like so my you, impression yeah. of unions back then was, you know, this big systemic thing that this like complicated bureaucratic entity that just kind of got in the way of everybody didn't really help anyone. If somebody was actually in trouble, like it's kind of like insurance companies were like, if you're really in trouble, it's not going to step in and help you if you yeah. need it. But like you, you know, but you have to like pay into like, that was my general impression of unions, not because I had sought out any information about them, but it was just sort of the impression that accumulated over a lifetime of subtle anti-union rhetoric. Thank you, United yeah. States. Um, I mean, that's here too. Like you hear stories of like, oh, so-and-so does nothing at work and it's unionized. You can't get rid of them. And like, blah, blah, blah. And like, why am I paying these all, dues? And But it's all, it's all lies. It's all lies. <laughs> <laughs> lies and propaganda. So, so, you, so what changed for you then? Because like uh, you said you were a little bit undereducated. So like, um, that was five years ago. Was there a turning point where you started to be like, you know what, maybe I do want to, uh, I don't know, have better benefits or wage minimums and things like that. Like what happened? 
Yeah, I think, um, you know, you're, you're coming along in your career after a certain point and you're just like, something doesn't feel right. I can't put my finger on it, hmm. but you know, like I, like, I love my job. I love Titmouse. You know, I am so proud of the New York industry and the intense talent there. But, you know, the macroeconomic trends affect us all, mm -hmm. including those of us lucky enough to work in the entertainment industry. Um, and, you know, you're watching these huge animated blockbusters. You're watching your, your cult, like the New York culture be like an export all around the world, right? And you're a part of that. But then you're just like, but why don't I have any savings? Gotcha. But why is it so hard to date? But why, you know, why aren't I in a place in my life that I was told I would be after working hard, after, you know, like doing everything right, doing everything the grownups in my life told me to do. And right. yet I'm not reaping the, the promised rewards. What happened? So um, even as like a tenure uh, into the industry, senior animator, lots of skills, worked on tons of shows, like, you know, you still were realizing that the life goals that you had for this stage of your life slash career weren't realities and like 10 years had gone by and and uh you still hadn't accomplished those things uh it's a very eloquent way of putting it yeah I, guess? Um, and I know oh. a lot of and i know a lot of people feel you know it's sort of like the millennial kind of yeah. dilemma right um yeah. we've all we've all read those articles uh we've all you know heard the stories um so uh what what would turn me on to on to collective action in general is actually I was radicalized by a coworker. We were at a party and we both got a little drunk and be, and candid. And you have to keep in mind, like, and this is like five years ago, right? So I'm like five years into my career, not ten. Mm. Um, you know, and um, or I think it was like six years into my career. Well, that doesn't matter. Um, you know, and and we just got to talking, and then there was like another person that I knew, and like we got to talking, and I'm just like. Wait, it's not just me because you have to because because you have to understand the culture of uh, the culture was so different it was like a complete 180 like you didn't discuss how much money you made that was taboo you didn't talk about work and like you were you were just because we all were born of the fire of the recession like you were just grateful to have a job right mm -hmm. but then after five years of consistently having a job you're like wait, 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 wait you know what things are actually pretty chill now you know like, you know, we're like, things just weren't quite adding up. So we got to talking. And then um, at that time, I was teaching at Montclair State University. And um, the train back would just like the peak hour trains were just constantly canceled. So I just had hours and hours to kill on this campus. So um, like the good little nerd that I am, I spent all that time in the library because it was cold. <laughs> and I was like, let me look up let me just look up unions. Let me look up like labor and stuff like that. So I got like a huge stack of books and I was reading it. And with every book I was reading, I'm like, unions are the solutions to literally all of my problems, you know? <laughs> because the thing is like the, the mistake that everybody has been making five, 10 years ago was we were thinking about things individually. Yeah. It doesn't make sense, right? Because animation is a team sport. Um, so, should, so should organizing, right? Um, and that's, I think, you, even even to this day, like you have conversations with people um, about organizing and, and they still have a very like individualistic mindset of it. Right. They're like, oh, I'm scared to stick my neck out. And I'm like, but it's not just you. It's all of us together. Like that's right. our leverage. That's our power is right. because we're all marching forward together and we've all decided to march forward together. Um, but what so, you just said is interesting to me because like, you know, from, I'm just thinking about my career journey. Like for me, it was like a big risk to switch careers. And then like, I did everything on myself and like, you know, learning how to get the skills and then going through school and like trying to find a job, like it feels very alone. And then once, like, I'm not part of a union, but like what you're saying is like, yeah, you, you know, you have to change this mentality of like, you're not doing it alone. You're actually doing it all together. Like even, even going through schooling and internships, like you're still doing this all together, learning together, becoming each other's coworkers and connections. So like, exactly. okay. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, even getting a job, right? Like, mm -hmm. yeah, it's the, job connect, like the jobs out. that I've gotten have been through my connections of people helping me and being like, Hey, like you should check this out and like putting a good word in for me, et cetera, et cetera. Like it's like, yeah. yeah. That's how animators do. We help each other out. Like, it's like, we're a team, you know? 
totally interesting cool so you're reading all this and you're like unions are the solution to all of my problems yep. um and then what <laughs> and then what uh you reach out to the animation guild and they send a field rep to start talking to you and coaching oh, you wow. and so this was training this was, you this was like five or six years ago or whatever uh so this specific thing was more like last year mm. uh, so like once again like a lot of you have to do a lot of internal cultural work to mm -hmm. kind of prime your community for organizing right because um like a like a lot of it was just like education just like understanding labor law understanding employment law you know it's it's kind of looking deeper into into the state of things like i i, I spent a lot of time just like reading books and educating myself to kind of get a big picture so it can understand like what what needs doing you know and then like you meet with people like you know you have a you have a conversation with one friend and they're like oh i think you should meet this person and you know and just like the friend work at work you know <laughs> uh eventually you kind of you know you, you get to a point where you're just like guys i think we should start a union <laughs> yeah so so like i guess um you like educating people is really hard, especially when you're at work and everybody's working. So you were just having a lot of anecdotal conversations and like sharing information that you, yeah, yeah, you had and yeah. realizing that, you know, there is like a collective want for, uh, you know, wa guaranteed wages and benefits and things like that. So you decided to reach out to the union and get a union rep come down and everything. Wow. That's that's a lot. And that's also like a huge responsibility and also courageous. Like, you know, did you ever feel did you ever feel pushback from anything or anybody like any awkward conversations or like? Um, like, so once we got into actual organizing itself, yeah. obviously, you know, there were a handful of people who were like, no, my coworkers are going to hold me back. Like, I'm very happy with the way things are right now. Hmm. Um, no, thank you, ma'am, which is which is fine. Like what I love about organizing and the ethos of it is you're only ever meeting people where they're at. You're only ever bargaining from where people are at. Hmm. Um, it is purely democratic. So if the majority of people want a union, it makes sense to unionize. If only 30 percent of people want a union and 60 percent are like, no, thank you, ma'am, then why should you know like why should that minority speak for the majority you know um that means that more work needs more cultural work needs to be done you're yeah. not you're not selling people on anything you're the thing with collective action is you know it's you, you don't need it to be unanimous but you do want a super majority behind you yeah you know and you want to be behind them so um in terms of meeting resistance, it's a really tricky question to answer because so much of the process is just feeling people out and having candid yeah. conversations with people. Yeah, I'm just wondering, like, it. say I'm at XYZ Univer or, um, Animation Studio somewhere else, and I'm very, I'm listening to this, I'm very interested in unionizing, and I do like a little anecdotal poll, and it seems like a lot of people in my studio are like, uh, not interested. What 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 would you recommend, or what does that mean in that case? Because in that case, maybe I would ask them. I would ask them why. You know, yeah. like let's say I approach somebody. Um, well, because the thing is, like, you don't you don't start with, "Hey, what do you think of unions?" Yeah. Right. Because people have a lot of preconceived notions of what they are. They have a lot of prejudice. And like, you know, for all the people listening to this podcast, here's what a union is. All all it is is a group of workers coming together to negotiate with their employer over their working conditions right so does so now that you're part of IATSE does that mean that um you have to uh go with what IATSE wants to negotiate or do you have like a separate union agreement in New York then uh Titmouse in Vancouver then Titmouse in LA et etc cetera, etc cetera? yeah that's a really 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 good question um so the way it works is so New York Titmouse would have a very its own unique agreement mm. with the Animation Guild. Um, it does not make sense to impose LA standards onto New York. New York as a city functions very, very differently from Los Angeles. Our needs are very different. 
Um, and it just, it's not what we want, right? Because yeah. as I said before, you always want to meet people where they're at. We're not at where LA is at, right? So we can only negotiate up from where we are currently. Um, so what you're talking about is like a standards agreement. Um, so the Animation Guild out in LA has, um, so, so um, the IA has, I think, what's called the basic agreement, another agreement that they negotiate with the AMPTP first. And then the Animation Guild and a couple other guilds, they go in and negotiate their agreements upon what, like, that are, like, the basic is kind of like the basis of the Animation Guild's agreement, but there are like okay. specifics to the Animation Guild that then they also have to negotiate with the AMPTP themselves. But on top of that, they also have, so like they have like an area standards agreement where all the studios in LA are under the same agreement, which is super, super, super great for, for the workers. Yeah. Um, but, you know, because it ensures that like you get to keep your benefits package as you move from studio to studio, right? Like, right. Yeah. It's, it's amazing. Um, but there are still a couple of studios, even out in LA, who have their own separate agreement with the Animation Guild that they did not want to be part of the standard agreement. So New York would be the same situation. Um, I mean, five, 10 years in the future would be great for us to have a New York City standard agreement. You know what I mean? But like, right, I, like right now, my only focus is with, um, with Titmouse and the employees at Titmouse. Makes sense, makes sense. So, okay, so um, what, like what exactly, so I'm just wondering, you know, like a lot of animators are like contract to contract, et cetera, et cetera, like to get a full-time, um, position with a salary is kind of difficult. So like, how does the union, how does unionizing change that? Um, the union, so, so when we're saying things like the union, right? Like what you're talking about is us. Yeah. So it's not this third party that swoops in and like changes all the rules and like, that's that. So the only things that change are the things that we want to change. Um, so our job is so honestly, it's entirely up to the employees of Titmouse what they want. Um, most of us are very, very happy with um, being independent contractors. It gives us, you know, it gives us um, a lot of flexibility to go from studio to studio. We can right. like, do freelance, we can do stuff on the side, you know. Um, like I can't get into like specifics um, because right. like we're not negotiating yet. And like if but we if, if you go to a different studio, you're you're not part of the union anymore. Uh, no, you, um, you could put your membership on pause is my understanding of it. Yeah. Okay. So I, I think that because Titmouse would be the only unionized animation studio, um, obviously that, you know, we wouldn't block anybody from working at other shops because that's just not a tenable. There's more animators in yeah. New York, <laughs> you know, than just the one shop, but, um, yeah, so it, so like, basically we would negotiate for, fair conditions that would make things fair for everybody right like so no, it doesn't matter if you're like on a six-month contract or like a two-year contract or whatever contract three months you're part of the union if you work at tim mouse yes interesting so what exactly i don't know if you can go into specifics but like what are some of the basics that have changed with unionizing um so nothing has changed yet like once again we don't have our collective bargaining agreement set right. um right, 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 so right. We've, yeah so we're at the stage that we are unionized and that um, our union has been recognized, um, voluntarily recognized by Titmouse, which is huge, by the way, yeah. and just speaks on the speaks on the relationship that the employees have with our employer, which I think makes Titmouse such a unique place. Like Titmouse is small enough that we 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 have a relationship with upper management, right? Like I know them all by name, and they all know me by name, and they recognize me. Um, but it's also just big enough that like we need to start unionizing now, mm -hmm. um, you know, like Vancouver unionized last year. Um, and it's, you know, it's it's a sign of the times. Right. Like you don't form a union because you're like, oh, fuck the boss, you know, right. um, you're like, I just you want form... some livable working conditions. <laughs> yeah, you, you form a union because you want a say in your in your benefits package. You know, yeah. it's about it's about having a voice. It's about having a seat at the table. Um, and the same would apply with, you know, the Titmouse Union as it fits into the Animation Guild as a whole and how the Animation Guild as a whole fits within the IATSE. Mm -hmm. um, so it's all about having a seat at the table. It's all about having your voice heard and making sure that everything is fair for everybody. 
Um, does that mean that you have to make compromises? Absolutely. You know, does that mean that I have to, it doesn't mean that like, you know, my standards go down, right? Like it's not going to be uh, the case where like, oh, I have to take a pay cut so that everybody else gets a pay raise. Like that's not how that works at all. Mm, okay. But it might be a matter of, okay, you know, we might not get to vote to strike until after, you know, the the rest of the IATSE makes their vote right. because of just how our negotiations are structured. So, right? okay. Can we focus on maybe on the pay if you're, if that makes sense a little bit? So like sure. right now, if I want to get hired by a studio, they may say like, what is your day rate? And then I tell them and then they're like, eh, too high or like, fine. And then I'm like, oh, maybe I should have said more. Or they'll be like, we'll hire you at this specific rate. And I just have to be like, do I want to push this or accept? So like everybody potentially could be working at totally different pays based on what they negotiated or, um, you know, what they were offered and they just didn't know to accept more. So does, yeah. so does a union try to standardize like a junior level animator comes in at this, a yes. mid-level animator has this. So like Sam fresh out of school and like, you know, X, Y, Z internship, maybe I'm not saying it's too much, whatever is like, Hey, fresh student, you're eager to work and, uh, you're going to work for $5 an hour. <laughs> and me as a, you know, a little bit naive student who just wants to work right away is like, sure, I'll accept that and work really hard, blah, blah, blah. But a union would change that to be like, no, if you want to hire a fresh graduate, they come in at this level, yes. et cetera. And yep. okay, cool. Great. <laughs> yeah, right. Like, you know, it would have protected, it would have protected my coworkers. It would have protected me. It would have protected like, so um, without getting into it or naming names or numbers, but hmm. one of my coworkers was making a little over half of what I was doing the same job. Granted, oh. I had 10 years experience and this was their first job. Yeah. But almost half, really. So does that come to light through the union or um, like is everybody's salaries like kind of exposed in a sense? Um, I don't know the details of that specifically. Um, I think, um, this is this information is the result of just us sharing gotcha. our wages. Gotcha. Like, hey, how much are you making? How much are right. you making? You're I'm like, like oh. <laughs> buddy, you need to go and ask share your wages if you get anything from this chat. Share your wages more. Honestly, like that has helped me so much in just asking like what people make at this expected job because like I don't know my first job I was like I have no clue like yeah the, it's, like it's, what to make and people yeah, will take advantage of that and they know right like whatever. Yeah. So I, other than wages, you, like benefits, you mentioned a couple of times, what do you mean? Like health benefits, like. Yeah. Health benefits, things like overtime. Are those, uh, are those specific things that are usually in a contract? Because uh, when you're working at a studio, they put in like health benefits. Cause like, as far as I am aware, at least maybe in Toronto, a little bit more, you don't usually get any benefits written into your six month, one year contract. It's just like kind of wages. Uh, it depends on the, it depends on the studio. Right. So um, it depends on your studio and it depends on your employment classification. Okay. So if you are hired as an independent contractor and I don't know how the tax code in Canada works, but like here in America, uh, you know, you would be you would be um, a 1099 employee, meaning that you are in charge of your own taxes. Um, yeah. You know, that is one type of employment classification and your relationship with your employer are governed by those rules. Um, if you are a full-time employee, um, work, you know, and you, um, and you get a W-2 form, uh, for your taxes, then, you know, you have a different re relationship with your employer. Um, so it's all about employment classification. Um, like if you're staff, uh, or if you're a supervisor, you're not qualified for overtime. Um, if you are just a regular employee, you are qualified for overtime, after 40 hours with exceptions, if you are in specific industries under which animation falls. So, mm. um, so it's like, right. And, and, and this is where I mentioned that education coming in handy, understanding your local employment laws, understanding what your labor laws are, because these are all things that dictate your benefits for, okay, here's a great example. Um, currently, uh, New York is an at-will employment state, which, and Titmouse, we are all at-will employees, which means that we could get fired for no reason at all. Oh, I love but that. But we can also walk off the job for no reason at all. And then they can't sue me for doing that. I can't sue them. Okay. What, um, and so what 
a, a collective bargaining agreement would do and what having a union presence would do is would eliminate at will employment. It would basically mean that if Titmouse wanted to fire one of us, they would actually have to like give us a good reason. Yeah. That being said, Titmouse has been on the on the whole rather fair with you know their firings like they don't just like right you know they they don't they don't abuse at will employment like they're yeah. very you know what I mean like usually if anybody was let go from Titmouse uh the rest of us low key side uh a sigh of relief <laughs> so okay uh, all right sometimes you get one of those employers you know but it, it also means that you can't just quit as well then you can't just be like uh, okay bye that would be up to whatever we negotiate in the collective gotcha. bargaining. Interesting. So it sounds like there's a lot of a lot of like nuanced things that you're nego- like that would have to be included in this. Like, yeah. I'm just wondering. Like, I have like first of all, I don't want to like even take the time to like understand my labor laws because it's just like boring to me. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> now I gotta go research this. I just want to work in anime. Like, I don't want to understand no. tax blah blah. Only I knew but- somebody with like a podcast who could like. Break- <laughs> and like a good and entertaining yeah who knows (laughs) i don't know but you know what i mean like i feel like the average person is not super interested in that and they're also really not you know the average person may never come across a situation where they're fired on the spot but if it happens to them then suddenly they're like oh well this shouldn't have happened for whatever dramatic reason but it sounds like there's so many things to be aware of like how how is every like now that now that Titmout is, has gotten into this, is there like been training or like education sessions for everybody to kind of understand what even all the terms of what they're negotiating goes through? Um, so we kind of, we did that preemptively. Um, so when you're organizing, like you reach out to people and you mm-hmm. have conversations with people and yeah. education is a component of those conversations. So most people understand the basics if they have any questions like you know I had some people who are constantly texting me you know we're hop on zoom calls and I'm explaining how this works and how that works um this is a special interest of mine so like I can yeah, talk I was gonna say are you it. doing this just for out of the goodness of your heart <laughs> uh I mean I'm doing this for myself as well yes. as my co-workers and there's nothing wrong with that right? right like right right at the end of the day when you're voting for a union and it's just you and the booth you're gonna vote in your self-interest that's yeah. human nature and there's nothing to be ashamed of there that's natural and that's something that you have to take into account um you know uh um speaking, I mean, not from my experience, but the experience of organizers that I've worked with who've been like organizing for 15 years, it's the people who want a union out of the goodness of their hearts that are the easiest to sway to the employer's side. Hmm. So it is the people acting out of their own self-interest who ultimately um, make most of the progress for unions. Makes sense, honestly. I'm wondering, like, you know, is there any details about unionizing in an animation field or like a tip mouse or whatever specifically that we haven't covered that would be good to know about or just interesting um, to know about? I would like for the interests of this podcast specifically, I would just hmm. say, talk to your coworkers. Yeah. Just like have a candid conversation. Like, how do you like your job? Really? Like, how is it going for you? Is there something you think could be better? Is there something that we can protect? Do you think that collective action can solve some of these problems? Yeah. How do you think your boss is going to react? Like, what do you think? Like, do you think they'd be opposed to this? Like, what would retaliation look like? You know, and just have honest conversations with your coworkers. I think I I derived a lot of joy from organizing because I got to have like really meaningful, deep conversations with so many people and got to bond with and connect with coworkers that I never would have gotten a chance to speak with. Oh, that makes sense. Like, you know, everybody chooses to be in animation for a specific reason or dream or whatnot. And then to like dig deeper and say like, why are we doing this? Why are we connecting? Like, is this fulfilling kind of our life goals and, and uh, making us happy, which people don't typically talk about. Like even before I started this podcast, I had no clue. Like, and people didn't talk about it. And I'm always surprised when well, yeah, I guess I'm not anymore, but like people are surprised still that, you know, they don't, people don't really share this info. Kind of people are kind of like heads down in, in the skill slash, I want to be a better artist, but then, you, you know, you have a whole life beside you. Like sometimes I've had chats being like, okay, well, if you don't make a lot of money in animation, like where else is coming from? And people have told me about like, they have investment strategies on the side and other things that they, they do to make it worthwhile. I'm wondering, you know, maybe just on that light, 
do you see the union as, you know, thinking back to like five, six years ago when you're like, hey, this maybe isn't fulfilling my millennial dreams. Do you see the maloon, the maloon, <laughs> this unionizing as like a good step towards building that kind of future you want? Because because uh, you also could have said like, hey, the animation landscape for me right now isn't doing it. I'm going to look into a different career that maybe is a little bit more lucrative, for instance. I mean, I almost did. Well, okay, but that's important to know, like, but also, I guess, did you reach a point inside where you had a turning, like, you could have gone either path and said, like, hey, I'm going to continue doing this thing that I've already invested in and try to make it yeah, build yeah. towards something or? No, I, I definitely got to a point where, um, you know, I was like, really, really burnt out. I wasn't necessarily satisfied satisfied with my career and realized that this was all, this was all coming from me. Like, this wasn't like external forces at play. This yeah, was... Yeah me contending with my own life choices. And um, I went, I, I did an animation workshop in France and we had just a, like one of the most phenomenal teachers ever. And um, I asked him like, you know, I asked him a question privately. I'm like, listen, like one of the reasons I did this, this uh, program was because I just wanted to like decide for myself, like, do I belong in animation? And he was like, well, do you still love animation in general? Like, do you still like watch animated programs and stuff like that? I'm like, yeah, I do. He's like, well, then it's not animation. It's the job. And that was kind of my epiphany huh. where the, you know what I mean? Like when you're, when you're learning, when you're in school, like, especially if you're so like industry minded, you wrap your artistic identity around your job. And it took and it took me a long time to realize that those are actually two very separate identities. And, and yeah. it was a lot of work for me to separate them, right? Because like, as a student, you're just thinking like, I just want a job. I want to break into the industry. Like I have, like, what are all the things that I have to do? Like you, you start off as like, cause, cause as a student, it's all, it's always just been like you, 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 your projects, your ideas, your film, all about you look at like you could be the next Rebecca Sugar if you wanted to, right? Yeah. And then you work in the industry, it has nothing to do with you. Yeah. Nobody cares about your artistic vision. They're like, can you animate this, right? That's that's where it becomes more like factory work, right? You're just on yeah. an assembly line, you know? And then, but like you, but you come into this assembly line with this identity of yourself as an artist, you know, working for the industry, like somehow your creative vision is gonna like be the, you know, and it's, it's sort of like a series of like personal rejections after a while, you know, and like you go into your dailies meeting and like you get notes from your director, like everybody like pats you on the head and says, good job. And they keep hiring you back. But the majority of what you're hearing is like, you're getting drawovers, you're getting this, you're getting that, you know, you're not getting like, once again, you're passed up for the supervisor role. And it's very hard not to internalize that. But something that you have to realize is you can't internalize that into the art side of you. You have to internalize this into the employee side of you. Yeah. Um, and that was something that I was doing. I was misdirecting all of the energy I was receiving and taking it personally. And that was a huge mistake that I made. And so, you know, I had to really separate that out because at the end of the day, you know, what, like, why are we doing this? Right. Exactly, and like, you yeah. have to ask this yourself all the time. Like, why are you doing this? Um, and I think for me, I lost that. And it wasn't until I realized like, there's the job side of animation and then there's the, your personal art side of animation. Totally. I think so, that's, so, so I think that's actually so important to um, come to the realization because like, there's completely different strategies to excelling in a job and like, you know, getting the feedback and doing that, doing the work, being hard, those three trifecta things you said, then to being like a creative artist. And I think it's, I think it's so interesting what you said, like, do you love animation? Yeah, I have a passion for animation. I, I think it's super entertaining. I love it. But does that mean you have to create it yourself? Like, no, because you can go home at the end of the day at an office job and watch animation and still love it and appreciate it. But and then the like deeper level, which you said is you go through school and everything's about you, you know, your design, putting your unique spin on something to stand out, you know, doing the hard work, but everything you create is your ideas, your story, your characters. And then as soon as you enter the industry, all of that gets squashed. And almost every single person I've had on this podcast 
has something they wish they were doing on the side. They have a show idea they wish they were doing. They don't have time for it because they're always working. They have, you know, they do art on the side because they still have that need to have that creative outlet. But it's, but like, if you, what you're saying is when you were trying to put those two together, you were taking feedback and things that you didn't see as success in your career so personally and attaching that to like your own creative visions and things which just made you feel burnt out and like not wanting to do this anymore when you separated those two things do you think you started to excel more at work and find it less burning out and easier to Absolutely. Yeah, yeah it was yeah I mean I can't say it was as easy as as you know flipping a switch yeah tomorrow think, done yeah <laughs> right yeah but it's definitely like my attitude towards work has completely shifted because hmm. I don't need work to be creatively fulfilling anymore yeah like um, cause I have that on the side, but also I think that, I think also what's important and to bring this back to the concept of a union, that separation in my identity also meant that once I started seeing animation as a job, I started seeing it for what it was yeah, and totally. realizing that, oh, we need a union. Yeah. You're just, you're literally just a cog in a wheel in a factory. There's like a end product and you are part of that, the cost of goods sold. Like that's it you know yeah. like yeah. unless you're unless you're like writing the series itself and like you know being the showrunner then you're executing somebody else's vision like even when you said you got pat out on the head but all these notes like that's just part of the machine yeah <laughs> yeah and it's totally right and it's just like and and the thing is like there's nothing wrong with that either like totally. i i got to work on super gel like, I, know. Yeah, I know I you know what i mean like i got to work on <laughs> super gel and ball masters Come on. And right now, like the show I'm working on right now, uh, the show creator is somebody that I met at Ottawa. And, you know, they hired me for this job. They're like, yeah, it's like the South African creator. And I was like, off the cuff, I'm like, there's no way it's this person. But I'm like, is it this person? Like, yeah, it's this person. I'm like, hell yes, let's go. <laughs> you know, like, there's nothing wrong with that either. Totally. Right? Yeah, you want to, you want to fangirl about your job. Like, that's, that's, that's also amazing. I love that. Yeah. And also, you're, you're doing creative stuff, essentially, as a service as well. It's yeah. like, yeah, so it's not, you know, I, I didn't want to like bring the mood down and be like, oh, cartoons are traumatic. Like, no, no but I think, I don't think it brought, for me, it didn't bring the mood down. I think good, it was good. an important separation. So I like understand, which, you know, kind of like wraps up the whole chat of what we've been, why unions and what we've been talking about, because, you know, you yeah. are, you are selling your labor every single day as an animator. Absolutely. Like other people are making so much money off of the work that I do um and a union is possibly the only vehicle for yeah. workers to get some of that back I mean right? I think the whole world is like that like the clothes we wear the products we buy like somebody's Everything. making them and it's they're not, not the ones getting rich yeah and that's you know and that's why labor is so like labor rights are like that's my whole thing. Like, that's my jam right now. If anybody asks me, what's your hobby? And I'm like, unions are my hobby. <laughs> They're like, oh, back <laughs> off. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, but uh, it's because it is like, it, it goes back to these macroeconomic trends, right? Like wages are stagnant. The cost of living is rising. Totally. The only, right. Nobody's like, looking out for you. Like, yeah, the governments and the corporations aren't going to suddenly change tack out of the goodness of their hearts. Right. Um, so we have to band together and fight for our rights. And we have the legal framework in this country to do so. Countries overseas don't have that privilege. They yeah, don't. Point. Yeah. And it's, you know, I'm going to curse again, but that's fucked up. Um, and, you know, but if we can create a really strong labor frame framework here in the United States, like it, it has the potential to shift the the, the macroeconomic tides right now totally. because unions are the only people like the people doing the work are the only people who are running the machines that they're also complaining against you know what I mean like everybody acts like it's like oh this one asshole who's like a billionaire up top makes this decision and then it ruins everybody's lives like you know down the chain of command there's like a lot of people involved in doing the work right but if all those people are like no what's that one person at the top gonna do what are they gonna do what are you going to do, Bezos? <laughs> okay, random <laughs> random question, maybe just on this because it was a thought. Um, has there ever been a fear that unionizing and bringing up wages and benefits and things will cost, uh, make costs rise and push more animation overseas? Um, 
Because you do have you do have other countries heavily investing in training animators like India and, and China, et cetera, for, for instance, have like have a lot of schools right now. Right. That's yeah. like, you know, I can't I can't speak for the entire country, but like. Los Angeles had a union for 70 years now. And there's more animation work happening there than ever before. You know, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's just a, it's just a thought that, you know, I, yeah. I also hear this all the time as well. Yeah, but also well, I think it's amazing that more people around the world are becoming animators. Like I love that more storytelling, et cetera. So it's like a yeah. you know, two two edge thing. Cool. Um, I'm just wondering, you know, as we're wrapping up, is there anything else that you wanted to share? Or like, you know, if somebody's listening to this and you kind of already gave the advice to just kind of contact coworkers, are there specific resources that you have found very helpful in explaining clearly or your journey or something along the way, or just general advice for somebody who wants to take a similar path and do some yeah. Um, unionizing it, yeah absolutely i mean first of all this could not have happened without you know the like the support of the animation guild um they have been it's it's sort of like the organizing committee like we're we're the team playing in the big playoffs like we're the underdogs and then the animation guild our, our union rep ben spate like he was our coach like he coached us through the whole process like he was amazing um so yeah, if you are listening and you're thinking of starting a union, um, do it. Uh, but here's a couple of key points of advice. Unionizing does not happen on social media. Mm. Just full stop. If all of a sudden you hear of like a studio that just flipped and you're like, how come I haven't heard of this before? That's good. That's a good thing. That means they did their job right. Um, if you are on Twitter and you see somebody going like, oh, hasn't this, why hasn't so-and-so unionized? What are those people doing? Politely tell this person that not just because it's not on social media doesn't mean it doesn't exist. <laughs> That's a big one. Um, keeping mm. this, keeping the campaign secret for a year, um, is the reason our campaign succeeded. Hmm. Do you think if but, it was more publicized, you would have had more pressure from other studios and, and, uh, outside influences it would have it would have completely buckled um yeah. basically if your boss finds out that you're unionizing that gives your boss the grounds to run an anti-union campaign hmm. and we're not going to win an election you're just like you're just not they have the money they have the resources like this this has to be a stealth tactic wow. um, okay. which is part of what makes it a lot of work um i can i can list specific organizing examples like for example apple was trying to organize through the company's messenger apps. So HR kept getting involved and HR kept making it harder for them and shutting things down internally because they were trying to organize internally through the workplace. And you, unfortunately you can't do it that way. You have to have all communications outside of the workplace. Okay. Uh, does it put you at a major disadvantage? Yes, but it's not that hard to do in this digital age. You know, you can't like be public about it on social media, but that's what DMs are for. That's when you right. slide into somebody's DMs and be like, hey, you don't know me, but I'm from the props department. And uh, I just want to kind of get to know you because we're coworkers and we're doing everything virtually. So I know this is awkward, but like, I would love it if I could chat with you for like 15 minutes. Like, yeah, why would I say no? Exactly. Um, other, uh, other pieces of advice I would give um, to people is like, you know, if, if you're in the United States and you're working at an animation studio, definitely reach out to the Animation Guild. Um, if you are not in animation, definitely do your research. Like we definitely looked into a lot of different organizations before we landed on the Animation Guild because when we were looking, the Animation Guild, they still couldn't organize outside of Los Angeles County. So mm, we were looking yeah. at some local theater guilds that did cover animation. Oh. Um, or like, you know, like we, we we looked around at a couple of different institutions first um, before the animation guild kind of reached out to us through the through like, I mean, we re, like we like we had a relationship with the animation guild, but like once the charter went through, they were like, hey guys, good news. And we we're like, yes. <laughs> this makes it so much easier because you hey. actually work with animators. So you know how this goes. Um but definitely, you know, um, if, I mean, yeah, it's all down to having conversations with people, you know, like that's, that's like, 
I think if there's like a theme for for this podcast or if like it needed to have like a title, yeah. Yeah. it's just just have honest conversations with people. Whether you're at a festival and you want to make friends with somebody whose film you really liked in the experimental film category, whether you're, you know, trying to flip a shop, like it doesn't matter. Like at the end of the day, unions are built up of people and you have to have conversations with people. And I have not had a single conversation that wasn't really rewarding, even ones when people were anti-union. Because the thing is like, you have to respect where they're at right? Like you have to respect why they feel the way they feel. And if anything, don't you want to understand the reasons for opposition, right? Don't you want to be able to develop your ability to defend your beliefs if they're challenged? Like not everything can happen. That's 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 words for life in in general. (laughs) (laughs) Hopefully. Yeah. Yeah, So um, yeah, it's, it's just been such a rewarding it's just been really rewarding all, all along. Maybe I'm in a unique privileged position, you know, maybe um, other people feel differently, but like for me personally, um, it was hard. It was time consuming. It was risky, but I would do it the same way again. Yeah. All over. Yeah. Well, I, I, I think you should be super proud of yourself. I'm proud of you. Like that's, that's awesome (laughs) that you, you know, five, six years ago, realized that you needed to do some soul searching and figure out why you're in this career in the first place. And will, is this the path you want to take? And not only did you do that, but you like went above and beyond did all your research, like made connections happen. And now, now you're unionized and like all the best for what comes out of that. I think that's amazing. Oh, shucks. <laughs> oh, shucks. But honest, I also just love like, maybe on the last note, just like, you know, have honest conversations with people. If that's the only thing you get out of this chat, like, I think that's amazing. So Thank you so much for having an honest conversation with me, Rachel. It's been an absolute pleasure to have you on the podcast. And I learned a lot and it was very interesting. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and if you're listening and uh, you want to reach out or follow Rachel, you can, and I'll of course include a bunch of the resources as links in the description of this chat that she mentioned, but you can reach out to her at her email, which is rachelgitlevich at gmail.com. I'm also going to include a link to her Vimeo where you can see her work and uh, just one of the things that she, I don't know if you want to speak to it in like one minute, but amaze.org, if you want to check that out. Yeah, um, it's a nonprofit organization that creates animated sex ed videos for children. Uh, they've been doing their, they've been doing amazing work. They're very inclusive. I made a couple of films with them. Um, and yeah, just, and you know, they could use eyeballs, they could use support. Um, just go over and check out. Maybe you'll learn a thing or two yeah. <laughs> that you missed in middle school. Um, but yeah, amaze.org. Cool. Amaze.org. And that's all for now. So thank you so much for listening. Okay. Bye. The music for this podcast was composed by Will Farmer and the graphics by Daniel Abensauer. I encourage you to look them up if you enjoyed their work.